I think it's a problem for a variety of reasons, beginning with the fact that it happened in the 1960s. I mean, you got Vietnam, you got Americans versus commies, you got drugs, hippies, you got all these protests, you know. It's a time of social upheaval. Yeah. And all of a sudden now, you have a church. The, the biggest religion in the world is holding an ecumenical council for the express purpose of addressing modern man. Um, and that right there is one of the problems, as silly as that sounds, because you get a radical traditionalist that says, well, why should you be addressing modern man? You should be talking about theology. And we have to understand the goal of Vatican II. So Vatican II you want to think of it as a personalist council. The theology present there has Thomistic roots. It has Augustinian roots. But the entire council has a personalism to it, the theology. And the uh, principles behind its teachings are all ordered towards the human person, to reach the human person, to have that dialogue with the modern man. And some people just simply yeah. find that off-putting. You should just give anathemas and call it a day. That's what some people want out of the ecumenical council. Give us another council of Trent. Give us another Vatican I. Mm -hmm. But that's not the approach Vatican II took. And there's reasons for that. I mean, you look at the period between Vatican I and Vatican II, you have... A lot of good things going on, but it wasn't all, you know, you, you had a problem of um, some people were being suppressed. You have suspicions of modernism, heresy. Yeah. And so for, for a lot, some people, it seemed like there was a crackdown and it prevented theological thought to flourish. And... So part of that is kind of, I guess what John the 23rd would say is opening the windows with the air in. Yeah. And like you and, have the siege mentality, I guess, because just uh, yeah. the previous century, like the papal states were literally under siege. Uh, yeah. The, the that war siege mentality area. is precisely one of the criticisms that uh, Ratzinger has in his book, The Theological highlights of Vatican II. Mm -hmm. And that is a topic, or that's a theme that you'll see in the more um, progressive theologians. Because Vatican II is a breakaway from the siege mode. And yeah. Well, right there, you have two interpretations going on. Oh, we should go back to siege mode. I think that's what a lot of more radical traditionalist people want out of the ecumenical council. We're under attack. We must hunker down, build our bunker. Mm -hmm. But that's not what the church should be doing. The church should be going out in the world with the message of Christ and evangelizing. That's not yeah. what it be. You have to be able to have a dialogue and converse with modern man. And you have to be able to talk to them in a way that is conducive for that dialogue. Mm -hmm. As modern man, you can't really use Neil's classic language. That's great and wonderful it is to have that precision. So the pastoral concern there, in some ways, the theological approach. The theology is the same. The teachings of the church are the same. The teachings of Vatican II did not change anything from Vatican I and before. Yeah. The presentation of that script and new. And some people just don't like that. And that's the problem for some people. How it is the church addressing modernity. They don't like mm -hmm. it. It has its concern for the human person. 
And so uh, you see like the common objection that the church watered down its teachings like in the um, right. documents of the council, like ecumenism, I guess they... Um, yeah. You'll see people say they changed the dogma, no salvation outside the Catholic Church. Right. And you look at the church teaching on that subject, it hasn't changed. Read Lumen Gentium 14. It says the same thing as Pius XII. It says the same thing as essentially Pius IX. At the very least, whatever the teaching of Vatican II is on no salvation outside the church, that has to be interpreted in a way that's consistent with the previous teaching. And those who say it is not, what you're doing is introducing a hermeneutic of discontinuity or a hermeneutic of rupture. And such a hermeneutic is opposed to what every single pope has said on the subject from john the 23rd to pope francis they have all rejected a hermeneutic of discontinuity in 1985 you have the extraordinary synod which approached the question of how do we deal with vatican ii 20 years later and one of the hermeneutics that put forth was you have to accept the hermeneutic of continuity that there was not a break in the church tradition and teachings with previous councils that's just a position that is not tenable you cannot hold and so people who do hold such a theological principle are placing themselves at odds with the authority of the teaching magisterium of the church who alone has the authority to say how to interpret a ecumenical council. And there are also, of course, the theological consequences of adopting this hermeneutic of discontinuity or rupture, because if a ecumenical council can break with previous ecumenical councils, then that church with that council is not an indefectible church, because now it can have the stains of error, sin, heresy yeah. and that betrays a lack of faith in jesus promise in matthew 16 where the gates of hell will not prevail against the church mm -hmm. and that's i think one of the problems right there is in order to talk about vatican ii you have to have a faith in christ and that faith in christ requires a faith in his church and her teaching authority. So when we talk about the crisis of Vatican II and being a crisis of faith, it's very real because people have a faith issue with the church herself and her authority. It's like another objection that the council led to the break with like the traditional um, customs and all that. Yeah. So you have to keep in mind it's the interpreters of the council who broke with tradition yes. so what you get is essentially the same argument from two radically opposing groups you have the radical traditionalists who say hermeneutic rupture break with tradition um we should reject vatican ii and go back to vatican one and what the previous teachings then you get the radical progressives and liberals who say rupture with tradition keep going mm. keep breaking away with vatican one and trent keep going keep going in this uh, progressive manner and yeah. we will call this the spirit of vatican ii mm. so yeah. you get two groups of people who began with the same false assumption, and you get two wildly different answers, and they're both terrible solutions to the problem. The so real solution the should be hermeneutic continuity. Yeah. Hermeneutic continuity. The spirit of Vatican II is not whatever you make it out to be to fulfill your progressive goals, because it really is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
That is the spirit of the council. And that is something we need to remind ourselves when there's an ecumenical council. The Holy Spirit is there working. Because the church is the bride of Christ and the church is gathered together in this most solemn exercise of her authority. So like, is there any unseen fruits that you think will eventually come about from the council? Like, um, anything that the council will inspire that hasn't yet come to fruition? Well, if we go back to the goals of the council, the address to modern man and his concerns, that source of dialogue, if we think about that there's a lot there for us to think about whether it's the teachings on religious freedom or all the teachings in Gaudium et Spes um, there's a lot there for us to unpack in how we begin talking about Christ with others that I don't think we're really cognizant of because we're too busy talking about is this an ecumenical council why is it a break with tradition that's what people are talking about they're not talking about here's this gift of the holy spirit and how do we implement it 